The military operate in a monitored, watched, satellite surveyed world. So if there's a domain that can't be watched, where locations and missions remain screened from view, then getting an edge there would really count. Beneath the world's waves, there's one of the quietest arms races there's ever been. Submarines are a familiar concept, out of sight, but post-war able to change the world with nuclear weapons. But it's not just about submarines. We think of drones as airborne, but their use under the surface is growing exponentially. These are gliders. Originally designed for observing vast areas of the ocean, they're now being put to military use. They can be at sea for months on end, their propulsion controlled by water buoyancy. They can provide invaluable underwater intelligence gathering and prevent enemy incursion, particularly when used in a swarm configuration. Imagine 10 or even 50. All major powers are understood to be developing this technology. And as this recent demonstration shows, underwater drones are already in routine use. The Royal Navy has launched a competition for large unmanned drones able to deliver a two-tonne payload. But the world oceans also hide our communication channels, the civilian and military infrastructure that could be vulnerable in conflict. Cornwall. From here, dozens of undersea fibre optic cables like these head out across the globe. They carry telephone calls, but mainly unbelievably large amounts of data, hundreds of terabits a second. They're the bedrock of our modern connected world, but they are at risk. Cable is critical infrastructure, and the cables are absolutely essential to our way of life. Most people think satellites carry all the data, but it's cables. Some 400 around the world, stretching for around 1.5 million kilometres. 40 cables leave the UK, eight from this beach, Porth Kerno, alone. Every time you post to social media, it'll travel through this beach to America and back before you even notice. So I want to find out how vulnerable they are. Could a hostile state attack this network? So undersea cables are no less but no greater target than, for instance, a shipping route or a road or a factory or something like that. So that's why they're important, because they're a piece of infrastructure. And so any piece of in infrastructure would be a, a target. So they're no less but no greater than any other piece of infrastructure. The view around the world amongst the top economists uh, is that if you hit a significant number of undersea cables, the world financial system would grind to a halt. It would stop dead and the economic damage would be huge. You'd have to hit a lot of cables, but uh, a state actor could do that simultaneously. If there was an attack, we've got the technology to do the repairs. Portland in Dorset, a warehouse full of cables and the ship which can lay or repair them, the CS Sovereign. Breakages happen about 200 times a year globally, but how do they mend the cables? The old-fashioned, yet still effective way, is to, in layman's terms, fish for the cable. Use this exceedingly long rope with one of these, a grapple hook, and bring it to the surface. But as Captain Paul Haynes, ship's master, and also a Royal Navy reservist explains, they have more modern tech too, in the shape of a remote submarine. Having ascertained where that fault is, then we can either cut the cable with the ROV, with a cutter, uh, grip it with a hydraulic gripper and then bring that end of cable to, to the surface uh, and onto the ship. Eventually, when the broken section's cut out, new cable can be spliced in. Actually, it has to be microscopically precise. The glass fibres fused together. The team are always on standby to respond anywhere there's a break in the North Atlantic. But are they worried about hostile action? Well, with fibre optic cables, it's probably less likely than it had been in the past with analogue cables. Um, it'd be very difficult to break into a cable, for instance, uh, to try and tap off uh, the information. And also that there are multiple cables running between various countries. So even if one would broken, um, it's unlikely that you'd impact, you'd have to cut a lot of cables to, uh, to cause a serious impact to a particular country. In conflicts past, we and other nations have targeted the undersea network. We're back at Porth Kerno Beach in Cornwall, and the small white building is the cable hut. Inside the old copper cables that used to send and receive telegraph messages around the empire from the 1870s until 1970. It's now a museum where the long-running story of cable attacks is told. War was declared on the 4th of August, 1914. The first act of aggression from the British 
was to go cutting German telegraph cables. So 5th of August, the cable ship Alert went out into the channel with, with grapnels and found and cut five cables. Uh, cables were then cut near the Azores, which just meant that we had control over all communications going in and out from under the water uh, from Western Europe. Forward to the Second World War, and with the advent of long-distance bombing, the authorities knew that Porth Kerno itself could come under attack. The idea was to move it underground. It's, um, it sounds very simple. Uh, we're in a valley with a, a big cliff or a big hillside beside us, and it was just that was tunnelled out. 15,000 tonnes of rock taken out, and the telegraph station was rebuilt inside that. And until the end of the war, the messages were processed underground. The whole area was heavily protected by troops, barbed wire and flamethrowers on the beach, pillboxes all around. But for the staff deep underground, there was always the fear of attack, even a raid on the tunnels by German commandos. If they had to escape, there was a way. This escape tunnel had been built into the rock by the Cornish tin miners who built the main caverns downstairs. It twists and turns on its way up, again a deliberate design point so that any enemy coming in from the top wouldn't have a straight line of fire. Although the area was bombed many times, the protection measures worked and the telegraph system remained operational throughout the war. But how could we protect the modern fibre optic network? There are some things we could do. For example, in Australia and New Zealand, whereas island states, they particularly depend on fibre optic uh, international cables, they've declared zones around those cables, which are protected zones. And if you want to take a, a vessel into those, you have to tell the uh, authorities you're going to do that, and they will monitor you. So that's, that's one way. Another way in the deep ocean might well be to put sonar sensing devices onto the cables so there'd be some warning if a submarine was trying to locate them, for example. There are a number of things we can do in defence, but we don't do them yet. 80% of the world's oceans are unmapped, unobserved and unexplored. A secretive battle space for the military to operate in. And the race is on to utilise it and protect within it the essential communication space it affords us.